everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, excuse me. Once again, we are the Sterling Historical Society. I'm Lorette Shore, and we have a lovely group of trustees and members and visitors, and we have some special guests in here. Um, I'm sure everybody is slowly learning about Lafayette coming to Sterling. And Alan Hoffman and Peter O'Reilly and Ibby <laughs> is going to be working with everybody that has any questions, any wonders, any whatever. Um, but I am going to let Peter slash Mr. Lafayette, or are you just dressed? <laughs> just I'll, I'll dressed. Explain that. I'll explain cool. That. Um, he's going to formally introduce Alan. Um, we're looking at September, September 3rd of this year. We will be having a, about a 30 minute event that we will be um, putting together. We're working on it already. Um, and so don't count on any publications you've seen yet, because some of them are lacking. Some of them have very um, flashy, Mistruths. So we're gonna we're gonna straighten that out. We'll get get all the information to the historical society members and to the town, and then it's up to all of you to spread the word. How's that? Awesome. Peter, if you would like to take the floor and welcome everybody, we're very glad to see you. Pete Riley and I'm the uh, chair of the uh, uh, Massachusetts Lafayette Bicentennial uh, 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 Committee uh, and um, it, that's, that's one of the many committees because Lafayette uh, toured all of the then 24 states uh, when he was here from uh, 1824 to 1825. Um, and I'm very pleased that some people thought I was dressed as Lafayette because actually we have some first class Lafayette interpreters who are very skilled, they're like great actors, extremely, extremely knowledgeable, but I guess in an emergency I would be like a body double. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, this is kind of way of, um, at, 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 at any rate, that's, that's uh, uh, that's why I'm here. You have to, hopefully you'll get a chance to look at these uh, look at these panels um, that uh, tell the story. But I'm actually here to introduce Alan Hoffman, who's the uh, president of the American Friends of Lafayette. He's been so for a long time, and he also translated uh, uh, Lavasor's um, uh, uh, La La Lavasor, who was uh, Lafayette secretary, uh, did a um, uh, wrote a book about the tour uh, in 1830. Uh, Alan translated it. And um, uh, the, the American Friends of Lafayette was founded in 1932, and it's uh, been keeping that, uh, uh, that, that, that alive, you know, that, the whole spirit, spirit. And there's a lot of reasons why, why Lafayette still remains, uh, remains quite significant. Uh, uh, most of you will probably, uh, or some of you will probably know the story when the American troops first came, first came to Paris in uh, 1917. Um, it wasn't Pershing, it was somebody else, but uh, it said, Lafayette, we are here. Uh, and that was the acknowledgement uh, of the special relationship between uh, France and the United States. So at any rate, this is Alan Hoffman, and he's the one who's giving the talk. Thank you, Peter, but uh, I'm going to need you oh, to that's stand right. here. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to create uh, the impression that Peter left by saying that I was have been president of the American Friends of Lafayette for a long time, and then say that the American Friends were founded in 1932, and I have been president since 1932. That's not the case. That is not the case. So um, we would normally be doing a uh, PowerPoint, but we had equipment malfunction, or it was more a combination of things. We we had the equipment, we didn't have the cord, we had the laptop, 
We got the cord, it didn't work with the laptop. So, but fortunately, like Lafayette in the uh, Virginia campaign, we, we will improvise. And uh, it was very nice of Evie and Peter to bring our educational panels because a number of the slides are represented on these panels. And, in, and just in case of emergency, I always bring this in my uh, So it's like belt and suspenders, and tonight we're going to be using the suspenders. So I will start with this image. Peter, please hold this one up. Um, so in 1846, Ensign and Thayer's of New York published a covered broadside entitled The Pictorial History of the United States. In, in addition to depicting the seals of each of the states and the territories at the time and printed information about population statistics in 1790 and 1840, battles of the American Revolution and the War of 1812 and a list of eminent men, you see in the middle that there are three figures dominating the field. On, in the center is Washington. To his left is Ben Franklin. And to his, on his good right hand is General Lafayette. Not Jefferson or Madison or Adams or Hamilton or even Jackson, who was very popular at that time, but a Frenchman, Lafayette. Curious, isn't it? Well, I'm here to tell you, not so much. It was June, we'll, we'll fast forward or actually, we'll go backward to June 17, 1825. It was the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. On that day, the American people gathered in Charlestown, Massachusetts, uh, to attend the laying of the cornerstone of the monument and to hear the speech given by Daniel Webster. The guest of honor on that day was Lafayette. It was the, he was called the nation's guest. It was the 10th month of his farewell tour of America. On that day, Lafayette, a Freemason since 1775, helped lay the cornerstone with Daniel Webster and the chief architect. Then there was a procession to, a, to the spot at the side of the hill where a vast amphitheater had been constructed. According to Auguste Levasseur, the author of Lafayette in America in 1824 and 1825, there were 45,000 people present. The 15,000 in the amphitheater were arranged as follows. Lafayette was sitting in front in an armchair. Then came the approximately 200 veterans of, the, of both the Battle of Bunker Hill and the American Revolution. Then other veterans. Then the ladies and behind them about 10,000. The other 30,000 people were at the top of the hill, perhaps out of earshot of the speech. In the middle of the speech, which was a panoram panoramic review of the history of America from its founding, from the founding of the American continents by Columbus to the present, giving special attention, of course, to the Battle of Bunker Hill and the American Revolution, he turned and addressed Lafayette directly. Uh, and he said, in part, fortunate, fortunate man. What measures of devotion do you owe to Providence, which has plotted out the circle of your extraordinary life? You belong to both hemispheres, to two generations. Heaven saw fit that the electric spark of liberty should be conducted by you from the new world to the old, referring to the French Revolution. And we whom duty and patriotism have called here long ago learned from our fathers to cherish your name and your virtues. In the 19th century, and really up until about the 1930s, Lafayette's reputation in America was extraordinary. He was already popular before his arrival in 1824 when he came as the last surviving major general of the American Revolution. But he was popular by virtue of his important role in the Revolution, his subsequent activities on behalf of his adopted land, which he considered America to be, his close friendship with Washington, and his storybook life. However, this trip during which he toured the country and each of its 24 states and was treated as a conquering hero reaffirmed his reputation and elevated him into iconic status. 
The only analogies that I could think of is the excitement caused by the Beatles among teenagers <laughs> in, 19, in the 1960s and the visit of John Paul II in 1979. The result was that Lafayette's name was imprinted on the American psyche. In the 19th century, when state banks printed legal tender, Lafayette's face appeared on bills in more states than anyone except George Washington, and he was often paired with George Washington. Scores of counties, cities, towns, and townships, actually about 80 in number, were named Lafayette, Fayette, Lafayetteville, Fayetteville, LaGrange, which LaGrange is the chateau that he lived in from 1800 to 1834, and everyone knew that during the farewell tour, and there's even one or two LaGrangevilles. There are countless streets, squares, and parks named for Lafayette. There are eight streets named for Lafayette in the city of Boston, and there are 12 in the five boroughs of New York City. Numerous statues and monuments were built. Uh, to honor Lafayette. I'll show you one of them, or Peter will show you one of them. Actually, we'll, we'll do two things at once. This is an image, take this one first. This is an image of the Chateau of Range that I just talked about. Can you pass that around? Yeah, you can pass it around. And this is an image of the Daniel Chester French monument to Lafayette at Prospect Park, Brooklyn, Daniel Chester French later did the Lincoln Memorial. Um, the good people of New Hampshire in 1824 named one of their highest mountains, Mount Lafayette. Lafayette College was named in 1826. There's a Lake Lafayette in northern Florida and the Lafayette River in southern Virginia. After France gave America the Statue of Liberty, America recipro reciprocated. An equestrian statue of, of, of Lafayette by Paul Whalen Bartlett was given to France in 1908. It was called the Children's Statue because the fundraising for the statue was a million school children getting pennies from their parents and their parents' friends. Um, it used to stand outside the Louvre, but after the I Am Pay Pyramid, which is featured in the Da Vinci Code movie, uh, was built, it was moved to a more obscure location uh, in, on the right bank of the Seine. That's an image of the children's statue. Prior to America's entry in the Great War on the side of the Allies in 1917, volunteer American flyers joined a French squadron under a French commander which became known as the Lafayette Escadrille. Others, members of the what was called the Lafayette Flying Corps, were dispersed into the French Armed Forces. Now, all this occurred before we declared war in April of 1917. A poem called The Sword of Lafayette appeared at that time, um, in which the last stanza ends, Forget us, Lord, if we forget the sacred sword of Lafayette. Now, the first stanza might be a bit of exaggerated, but this is what the poet wrote. It was the time of our despair when lion-hearted Washington, that man of patience and of prayer, looked sadly at each rising sun. In all the freedom-breeding air of hope and rescue there was none, when lo, as down from heaven left, there came the sword of Lafayette. As Peter said, General Pershing visited Lafayette's tomb where his aide in 1917, where his aide, Colonel Stanton, said famously, Lafayette, we, we are here. A song, Lafayette, We Hear You Calling, was published in 1918. The day after his arrival in France in December of 1918 for the treaty negotiations, President Wilson visited Pequot Cemetery where Lafayette was buried and had a wreath laid at Lafayette's tomb with a card that said, and I quote, in memory of the great Lafayette from a fellow servant of liberty. In 1919, Wilson went so far as to name a national park in Maine, the Lafayette National Park. Unfortunately, we lost that one in 1929 when a couple offered to double the land of the park 
as long as the name were changed. It became Acadia National Park. This is a, actually a true statement. The daughters were British citizens. They actually were, probably with a long memory. <laughs> President Franklin Roosevelt addressed a joint session of Congress on May 20th, 1934, the 100th anniversary of Lafayette's death, and there were numerous uh, commemorative events throughout the country, including, including a lot in Massachusetts. As a result of those commemorations, in 1935, the legislature, the great and general court, decided that May 20th, they, they passed a statute saying mm -hmm. May 20th is, is Massachusetts Lafayette Day, and the governor was directed to issue a proclamation each year declaring it to be Lafayette Day. There were three commemorative stamps honoring Lafayette in the 50s and the 70s, and in this century, the Senate made Lafayette an honorary citizen in 2002, and the House passed a resolution honoring him on his 250th birthday in 2007. However, it's not quite the same as it was in the 19th century, or even the first half of the 20th century today. And for proof of the statement that I just made, I will cite to you an article that appeared in the New York Times on August 31st, 2007, uh, just prior to the opening of an exhibition at the New York Historical Society about Lafayette and the Farewell Tour. In the article, the author writes that the society dispatched summer interns to different neighborhoods, including two of the streets in the city named for Lafayette, one in Manhattan and one in Brooklyn. The interns, history students at UCLA, asked dozens of people what they knew about the old boy. The responses boiled down to, Lafayette, we are clueless. <laughs> Definitely among the younger generation, not a soul knew who Lafayette was, said Louise Mirror, the Historical Society's president. Even older New Yorkers offered responses like, never heard of him, or at best, if they were really on the ball, sounds French. <laughs> but one fireman knew quite a lot, Dr. Mira said, and that was reassuring. And if you think about that, it's appropriate that if one person out of the 35 that they interviewed should know something about Lafayette, it was a first responder, because he was a first responder to our cause. So why was Lafayette America's idol in the 19th century? The answer is he played a critical role in making our revolution and continued to support American interests throughout his life. He was simply the best friend this country ever had. He also strived to spread the ideas and the ideals of the American Revolution to Europe, and he reaffirmed his close connection uh, to America on the farewell tour in 1824 and 1825. He was born in Auvergne, France in 1757, and he inherited a prestigious title and great wealth upon the early deaths of his father in the Seven Years' War, his mother and his maternal grandfather. He was an orphan at about 11. Uh, Lafayette traveled to America in April of 1777 to join our revolution on a ship purchased and provisioned with his own friends, carrying with him a commission in the Continental Army, making him a major gen general, which is the second rank in the entire army uh, beyond, behind the commander-in-chief. At the time, he was only 19 years old and a captain in the French army on furlough. He was introduced to Washington at a tavern in Philadelphia on July 31st, 1777, and invited to join his staff and serve initially as a volunteer without a command. On September 11, 1777, five days after his 20th birthday, in the Battle of the Brandywine, which was part of the British Army's successful campaign to take Philadelphia, he dismounted his horse and drew his sword to turn the retreating American soldiers around to face the British, and he was wounded in the leg. Uh, that in, in the second panel, the image on the bottom, is an engraving of Lafayette wounded at Brandywine. By December of 1777, when the Army entered its winter quarters at Valley Forge, Congress, uh, Washington, uh, 
was so impressed by this young man's character, his prudence in war councils, and his courage that he recommended that Lafayette be given a field command. And Lafayette was pestering him for a field command. Uh, and Congress approved, and Washington put him in charge of 3,000 Continental troops at Valley Forge, which was not an inconsiderable part of our entire army. That slide, that, that uh, image, the second image on the second panel is a, an engraving of Washington and Lafayette at Valley Forge. In 1778, Lafayette served in an abortive campaign to invade Canada in the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse in New Jersey, and in August in the Battle of the Rhode Island campaign, during which Lafayette and the troops that he had brought, along with General Greene, from the American encampments in White Plains, New York, to support the invasion of the Qu Quidnick Island, reached the ramparts of Newport. After the French fleet, which was there assisting us as a result of the treaty, uh, which was earlier in 1778, uh, learned that a British fleet was coming up to New York to rescue the British garrison. They went into Rhode Island Sound, both fleets were battered by a storm, a nor'easter. Actually, it was in August, but it was a nor'easter. <laughs> um, and the British fleet returned to New York, but the French fleet ret uh, ret came to Boston, as were their instructions, if, if they suffered damage. Lafayette was assigned by John Sullivan, the uh, commander-in-chief of this operation, a hot-headed New Hampshire lawyer and general, uh, to go to Boston and try to persuade the Count d'Estaing, who was a cousin of his from Auvergne, to come back and continue the, the invasion. He was unsuccessful. Um, but he calmed over the situation because uh, Sullivan had issued public orders chastising the French for leaving the scene of an invasion. Uh, he returned, he went by horse, like overnight, from, from uh, Tiverton to Boston. He came back in time for the evacuation and for his services during uh, this campaign. Uh, Congress uh, gave him a Congressional uh, Medal of Commendation. Now, the, the first, in the first panel, that image of Lafayette, Charles Wilson Peel from 1779, it is thought to be, from life, it is thought to be the most accurate painting of Lafayette from that period. Lafayette returned to France on furlough in 1779 and lobbied for more money and material, the return of the French fleet and French land troops, a French expeditionary force. It is fair to say that he and Franklin are most responsible for the decision made by the French court to provide that aid, and that aid included a 5,000-man French expeditionary force led by General Rochambeau. Lafayette was assigned to rejoin the American army and sent back to America on a new frigate called L'Hermion, uh, which was top of the line at the time. Um, and that's the ship of which there was a replica produced, and it came up the coast of the eastern coast of, in 2015. Uh, from the L'Hermion at the entrance to Boston Harbor, actually Marblehead, Lafayette wrote Washington on Thursday, April 27, 1780. I have affairs of the utmost importance that I should communicate to you alone. He disembarked from the Hermione at Boston on April 28th at General Hancock's Fort, which is now Lewis Fort, and spent several days in Boston before he went to Morristown by land, where he imparted the news to Washington that Rochambeau was coming with a fleet and a 5,000-man army. Lafayette's major military contribution to the American cause ensued in 1781 when he was sent to Virginia with 1,200 Continentals. In a campaign of skirmishes and smoke and mirrors, he and his undermanned army managed to entrap Lord Cornwallis at Yorktown, where Cornwallis and his 7,000 troops were defeated after the French West Indian fleet came uh, uh, to the Chesapeake, and Washington's and Rochambeau's army marched south 
to, to Virginia, and the siege uh, occurred. Lafayette returned to, uh, to France, a hero at age 24, and was made a Maréchal de Camp in the French Army, which is a major general in France. The, there is a slide, no, a slide. There's an image of Lafayette at Yorktown. It's in the fourth panel. It's a French engraving. The image of Lafayette's face is, probably, is pretty, pretty good, but the rest of it is imaginary. He's pointing to the ships in the York River and to the troops that are marching up the hill. During the 1780s in France, Lafayette played a role in supporting American diplomacy and interests. First with Franklin and later with Jefferson from 1785 to 1789, when Jefferson was our minister to Paris. When Lafayette visited Monticello in November 1824, Jefferson took him to the University of Virginia at an event in, held in Lafayette's honor in the newly constructed rotunda. Jefferson had a speech read for him that described Lafayette's role on behalf of American interests in the 1780s. What he pointed to was Lafayette's role principally in helping to open up numerous ports for American goods uh, on most favorable nation terms, including whale oil, which was very important, for example, to Nantucket. They had a big uh, whaling industry. With regard to the accomplishments of American diplomacy at the time, Jefferson said, I only held the nail. Lafayette drove it. In 1786, the people of Nantucket expressed their gratitude by devoting, by devoting uh, milk from every cow on the island to produce a 500-pound cheese to send to Lafayette in France. <laughs> this children's book called The Cheese for Lafayette uh, came out in 1950. It's a true story. On the reverse jacket is a um, an account in a Plymouth newspaper of the town meeting at which this decision was made. But that's like sending coals to Newcastle. Is it a children's book? Or is it that's a children's book, yeah. Uh, it's out of print now, but uh, it, it once was in print. Later, Lafayette played a critical role in the French Revolution. He called for the summoning of a national assembly in 1787 at the Assembly of Notables, and was a major player from 1789 to 1791 principally in his role as Commandant General of the National Guard of Paris, a citizen's militia, which he cre created shortly after the storming of the Bastille. He was also the principal author of the French Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, which was written, drafted, at Jefferson's apartments in 1789. That document became the preamble of the 1791 Constitution, and is currently referred to in the, uh, in the current French Constitution. His efforts to preserve order and mediate between the king and the people ultimately failed, and when the Jacobins' influence grow, grew, he went over the northern border into Belgium. He had been serving, defending his homeland with a 50,000-man army there. Imprisonment in German and Austrian dungeons and exile in Danish Holstein and Holland followed. And then upon his return to France in late 1799, retirement as a gentleman farmer at LaGrange. Until 1815, when during the 100 days of Napoleon's return, Lafayette served briefly in the Chamber of Deputies, and he served again from 1818 to 1823 during the Bourbon Restoration. He was defeated in the election of 1824. Propitiously, in early 1824, President Monroe's invitation to visit America arrived, and Lafayette decided to accept it. In July, he departed for America with his son, George Washington Lafayette, Levasseur, his private secretary, and a valet aboard a, the packet ship Cadmus. This trip, the farewell tour, was a unique event in our history, if not the history of the world. You may think that what I just said is hyperbole. However, I'm not the first, and certainly I'm not alone in expressing that. <coughs> in 1830, Edward Everett, 
uh, American politician, uh, orator, uh, historian, etc. President of Harvard University. He had more positions than any other person that I can think of. He was in the House of Representatives, he was a senator briefly, he was a diplomat, he was for a short time he was Secretary of State. He ran for president in 1860 on the Union, for, he was the vice presidential candidate on the Union ticket. He's also the man who uh, spoke for two hours at Gettysburg before Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Well, in any event, he wrote a review of, in the North American Review, which he was the publisher of at the time, about uh, Levasseur's book. And in the review, he praised the book, for which I am grateful, uh, he praised Lafayette, and he praised the farewell tour. About the farewell tour, he wrote, an event taken in all its parts unparalleled in the history of man. Here is this 67-year-old man, tall but somewhat portly, who walks with a limp and a cane and wears a hairpiece, who has wielded no military power or political authority since 1792 when he defended France uh, on the northern border, who then held no public position either in France or in his adopted land, America, and he's treated like a conquering hero, like a Caesar or an Alexander for 13 months in every corner of a vast country. There were parades, militia reviews, dinners, banquets, balls, meet and greets with school children and members of diverse private societies. There are dedications of public buildings and monuments a plethora of speeches and customary and voluntary toasts. Triumphal arches are constructed welcoming Lafayette all over the country in, in cities big and towns small. Americans of all races, each gender and of every age wanted to touch this man who had done so much for their country. A whole cottage industry of consumers was created. There are Lafayette prints, fans, hats, Buttons, bandana, bandanas, medallions, school sheet music, bottles, brushes, baby shoes, ribbons, and scarves. I, I have a uh, a sample. This is uh, not a. This was is a modern version of a, a patriotic scarf. The, the other one, yeah, a patriotic scarf made in Philadelphia in 1824. It has symbols. Patriotic symbols, flag, and it says, Welcome Lafayette. Can we send this around? Or? Yeah, you can send it around. There are Welcome Lafayette drums. Uh, Sturbridge Village owns a Welcome Lafayette drum. There's Staffordshire and other ceramic coffee pots, plates, platters, bowls, cups, pitchers, and jugs, including a set of dishes depicting Lafayette's arrival at Castle Garden in August of 1824. And there are ladies' kid gloves and men's kid gloves with his face imprinted on it. <laughs> Here are a couple of examples of Lafayette gloves. Uh, many painters, every American painter, wanted to paint for life, and many did. Uh, perhaps the most famous painting is this one. By, this is uh, by Samuel F. B. Morris. It's now in uh, the Senate chamber of New York City Hall. It was done, uh, you know, he won the competition, uh, competition of New York City to do that painting. On August 15, 1824, the Cadmus arrived in New York Bay with its precious cargo. As Levasseur contemplated Staten Island to his left, the noise of a cannon caught my attention from another side. It was the artillery of Fort Lafayette, which was announcing the arrival of the Cadmus to the city of New York. Because it was a Sunday, Lafayette disembarked in Staten Island and stayed at the home of the then vice president, a man named Daniel Tompkins. On the following day, he arrived at Castle Garden at the southern tip of Manhattan on a steamship that was uh, chosen, got the honor to bring him to Manhattan called the Chancellor Livingston, accompanied by a large flotilla of boats and a crowd once he reached the city 
estimated at between 50,000 and 200,000. He spent a few days there and then he headed towards Boston. Uh, he went through Connecticut, stopped in a number of cities and Providence, Rhode Island. On the, on the evening, late in the evening of August 23rd, he arrived at the Shirley Eustace House where he was greeted by a revolutionary comrade in arms uh, who was now Governor William Eustace. Uh, he slept there and on the morning of the 24th, in a parade of 70,000 pe uh, people, he rode into Boston. Uh, when, once he arrived in Boston, he, walked, he got off, out of the carriage, walked through the, the common. Uh, there, were double, there were rows on one side of girls and the other side of boys wearing Lafayette ribbons. Uh, he got to the State House where there were speeches, and then he was taken to dinner at the Exchange uh, Coffee House. Uh, before the dinner, however, he was taken to his apartments that the city had prepared for him. And these apartments are, uh, the building is still exists. It's on uh, Park Street, 20, it's 22 Beaker, Beacon Street. It's the Amory House. Half of it was set aside for Lafayette. And the city, I, I want to tell you what the city did, to, just to give you an idea of the lengths that municipalities went uh, to welcome Lafayette. So basically what they did was they gorgeously furnished this apartment. They rented the apartment, and I'm quoting from a uh, catalog called <coughs> Rather Elegant and Showy, the classical furniture of Isaac Vos, because most of the furniture was made by Isaac Vos, Vos and Sons. The city of Boston hired only the most respected craftsmen for the furnishings, both and sons for furniture and lighting, hedges for upholstery, draperies, and carpeting. Consistent with this high standard, they also selected the city's leading gilder and looking glass maker, John Doggett. He billed the city for the loan of two pairs of looking glasses, one pair valued at an extraordinary $425. The both furniture consisted of 78 items, including a beautiful rosewood couch, which is on the, uh, the jacket of this catalog and was the central piece at an exhibit at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, in addition, Mr. Doggett provided the general with five Gilbert Stewart portraits, one of each president, to hang on the wall because he wanted uh, Lafayette to be among his friends when he was in Boston. After the Exchange Tavern dinner in the evening, Lafayette visited John Hancock's widow of her, of, at her home. Now this visit is memorialized in a book by Louisa May Alcott, an old-fashioned girl. And while this book is a work of fiction, it has the ring of truth to it, because Louisa May Alcott's mother, Abby May Alcott, uh, would have been about 20 at the time of Lafayette's visit, and was likely at Madam Hancock's house because she was related to Madam Hancock, as was Mayor Josiah, Josiah Quincy, and he was there. Uh, so anyhow, this is how the this, this story goes. So this grandmother, the grandmother is telling the story of Lafayette's visit to her two grandchildren and a family friend. Uh, and Louisa May Alcott writes, well, by and by, the general, escorted by the mayor, drove up. Dear me, I see him now, a little old man in nankeen trousers and vest, a long blue coat and ruffled shirt, leaning on his cane, for he was lame, and smiling and bowing like a true Frenchman. As he approached, the three old ladies rose and curtsied with the utmost dignity. Lafayette bowed first to the governor's picture, then to the governor's widow, and kissed her hand. That was droll, for on the back of her glove was stamped Lafayette's likeness, and the gallant old man kissed his own face. <laughs> then some of the young ladies were presented, and as if to escape any self-salutation, he kissed the pretty girls on the cheek. 
Yes, my dear, here is just the spot where the dear old man saluted me. I'm quite as proud of it now as I was then, for he was a brave, good man, and he helped us in our trouble. While in Boston, Lafayette visited Harvard College on two occasions where Edward Everett addressed him, and then he went to Charles, Charlestown. On the 29th, he visited John Adams in Quincy. On the 31st, he headed north, stopping in seven separate towns on a rainy day and attending events in each of the seven. They included Chelsea, Lynn, Marblehead, Salem, Beverly, Ipswich, and Newbury. Citizens of New Hampshire joined the frenzy surrounding Lafayette's visit on September 1, 1824, a rainy day on which he and his entourage arrived in Portsmouth, having spent the night at Newbury. Although Lafayette proved to be a magnet for all Americans, uh, veterans, in particular veterans of the American Revolution, flocked to see him. Uh, September 1 happened to be the day of Franklin Pierce's graduation from Bowdoin College. As Peter <coughs> Wilmer writes in volume one of his two-volume biography of New Hampshire's only president, Franklin had been selected to give an honorary oration in Latin, and he wrote his father, General Benjamin Pierce, who was a veteran of the American Revolution, uh, to invite him to attend. Walner writes, in this he was disappointed, however, as the old general joined other Revolutionary War veterans at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to honor General Lafayette, who was on his famous tour of the United States. So Benjamin Pierce dissed his son's college graduation and his valedictory address to spend a few hours with Lafayette on September 1. <laughs> After visiting uh, Portsmouth and returning to Boston overnight, he attended the ball, which ended at about midnight. Lafayette headed west <coughs> to Lexington, Concord, and Worcester. And on the way to Worcester, we'll talk in a minute, he, he uh, came here to Sterling. And he returned to New York City for his second visit there. In Lexington, and I have another image here. In Lexington, a banner was hung at an evergreen at the entrance to Lexington Green. You can't tell from that, you can't even tell from the slide that I have. But that banner is 39 feet long, 9 inches high, and it's cloth painted with green paint. Um, so on the way to Worcester, oh, when, they, when, when Lafayette left Boston, the, the aldermen of the city conducted a public auction to try to recoup their investment. I don't know how they did on that. But anyhow, um, after sleeping in Bolton on the night of the 2nd, uh, he stopped here during on the morning of the 3rd. So he, there's a nice newspaper account of that, and I'll give you a little bit of the flavor. So the general was received at the entrance of the village by the selectmen of the town under a spacious arch fancifully decorated with evergreens and flowers. Uh, a man by the name of Isaac Goodwin, chairman of the Board of Selectmen, gave the welcoming speech. And he said in part, the name of this town associates with it the recollection of another transatlantic hero who, like yourself, sir, felt a sympathy for our father's wrongs and whose sword was unsheathed for their redress. So he's referring, of course, to Lord Sterling. William Alexander. Uh, he actually got it a little bit wrong. He was not born in Scotland. His family came over from Scotland. He was born in New York City in 1723. And he was actually older than George Washington. He, he was a seasoned uh, veteran at the time of the American Revolution. He was also uh, one of Washington's favorite generals. He was loyal to George Washington. Uh, in early 1778, there, uh, a number of officers, including General Gage, plotted to remove Washington because 
for the lack of success. And Lord Sterling overheard a conversation when uh, an officer drunkenly told about a letter that had been written by uh, General Conway to General uh, Gates, not Gage. Uh, and, that was, and that's how Washington found out about the Con Conway, what's called the Conway Cabal. He was also, at, at, for most of the early stages of the revolution, third in command. Sometimes when Washington, uh, when General Greene wasn't there and Washington left to go to Philadelphia, he put Lord Sterling in charge of the army. He had a close, uh, a reasonably close relationship with Lafayette. They fought together at Brandywine. They fought together at the Battle of Monmouth. After the Battle of Monmouth in uh, June, late June of uh, 1778, it was a court martial of General Lee. Uh, Lord Sterling was the uh, presiding officer of the court martial, and Lafayette was one of the principal witnesses at the court martial. And finally, in 1780, at West Point, after Arnold's treason, there was another court martial where Lord Sterling and Lafayette served. That was a court martial of uh, uh, Major Andre, the spy. Uh, so they, they did have a close relationship. Uh, and Lafayette, in his reply, says, the name of your place recalls the recollection of Lord Sterling. He was my intimate friend as well as companion in arms. I venerate his mem memory. And when at New York, I had the pleasure of calling upon his family. He actually visited uh, Lord Sterling's daughter in New York. So there was a relationship there. So after he uh, left Sterling, went through Worcester, um, and got back through Hartford, and got back to New York City, he spent some more time there. And then he headed west through New Jersey to Philadelphia before heading southward. He arrived at Yorktown in time to celebrate Surrender Day on October 19th. He reached Monticello on November 4th, spent 10 days with Jefferson then went to Montpelier, spent a few days with Madison. He spent much of the winter of 1824 in and around Washington, D.C. Uh, his original intent was just to visit the first 13 states, but he, by now he had received invitations from all the other states and he decided to accept them. Thus, he left Washington, D.C. on February 23rd for his southern and western campaigns. Uh, during the visit to South Carolina, Lafayette's party traveled to Columbia, where an incident occurred that uh, encapsulates this man who made no distinctions on account of race, color, or creed. In many of the southern states, local offic officials had issued proclamations and decrees forbidding African Americans, whether free or enslaved, for, from attending the public uh, uh, events like the parades and the militia reviews. So, so this uh, story takes place in, at a private reception after the parade and the militia review. And there it is. So it's written by a militia man who was there that day. He wrote it years later in a memoir. And this is what he writes. Two sentinels with fixed bayonets on their guns were posted at the door to prevent the entrance of intruders. Here I saw a strange but pleasant incident transpire. An old African, neatly dressed, came to the front door and started in. But the sentinels interposed their bayoneted guns to bar his entrance. The old man contemptuously pushed them aside, saying, Shaw, Shaw, see guns afore you was born. Been where they've been shot by soldiers, too, and without further opposition from anyone gained his way. He came straight to, straight to the room where the distinguished guest was standing among the crowd and said, I come to see General Lafayette. Lafayette turned, looked at him, and remarked, An old acquaintance, don't tell me who it is. The Negro advanced to the Marquis, and bowing, held out his hand and said, Howdy, Master Lafayette, you remember me? How you do, sir? 
Yes, stop. Don't tell me your name. Ah, I have it. Pompey, belonging to Colonel Buchanan, the first servant who waited on me when I came to America. When I landed at Georgetown, I was taken first to the camp of General Buchanan, near there, and Pompey waited on me, said he, as he shook warmly the old man's hand. Then the nobleman called for a glass of champagne with Pompey, which that worthy took with great dignity. Then he put out his hand and said, Goodbye, Massa Lafayette. We're getting old. We'll never meet again. God bless you. They shook hands again. Pompey went out, mounted his pony, and started for his home near Winsboro, saying he'd come to see General Lafayette. Now he'd done that. He was going home. Well, interestingly, the, those local officials were actually smart to bar the African Americans in their this from seeing Lafayette, because Lafayette, whenever he saw anyone, any person, he would always nod to them and be gracious. And there's a story about Lewis Hayden wrote this story. He was a slave boy in Lexington, Kentucky, when Lafayette arrived in May of 1825. And he tells the story in a memoir. And he later became a Boston abolitionist, politician. There's a wonderful photograph of him in a suit. It's not exactly like uh, Peter's. But, um, and he lived into the 17, the 1870s uh, or 80s. But he tells the story that when Lafayette was in the open carriage, he nodded at the fence that he was at. And so Lewis turned around, didn't see anyone, anyone on the fence except for him, and he was scared. So he jumped off the fence and ran as fast as he could under the, uh, the fence where they were going to uh, do the artillery salute, so he'd be with other people. Um, he said that Lafayette was the most famous man I had ever seen. His acknowledgment of me, recognizing me, treating me as a human being, made a, <coughs> such an impression on me that from that moment on, I resolved to escape my bonds, which he did. Mm -hmm. so. After Lafayette's uh, southern and western campaigns and his return to Boston for the Bunker Hill ceremony, he went, made a second trip to Concord, New Hampshire, second trip to New Hampshire. General Pierce was all over that trip. He was the host of 200 veterans, so he didn't really have to this is son. This is son's uh, college uh, valedictory address, but I guess he didn't know that Lafayette was coming back. Then he went to Maine, back through New Hampshire to Vermont, where which was the 24th state that he visited. This uh, image is a carriage owned by Dr. Jarvis of Vermont. He was a town father uh, in Claremont. And his carriage, it's a ceremonial carriage, it was used to bring Lafayette from Claremont to Cornish, and then uh, the Vermont authorities picked him up and brought him into Vermont. Uh, that carriage is in the collection of what's now called the Long Island Museum in Stony Brook. It used to be called the Long Island Museum of Art, History, and Carriages. They have a big carriage bar. So he, he, he <coughs> Completed his bucket list of all 24 states. He went back to New York City. Uh, when he left New York City on July 14th, a uh, militia unit, which had renamed itself National Guard in honor of Lafayette's service in the Parisian La National Guard, was in attendance to see him off. This uh, poster, this is, see if you can straighten that out. This is a poster commissioned by the uh, by the United States National Guard in 1989. It's actually based on a painting that they commissioned. It shows Lafayette shaking hands with that militia unit. The legend underneath that poster tells the story and then says, by the end of the 19th century, every state militia had taken the name of National Guard. Mm -hmm. So the reason that it's called the National Guard today uh, is Lafayette. Mm -hmm. um, I want to tell a couple of stories about Lafayette's role with uh, the 
former president, uh, which is the stories are told in this book. Um, by the way, Lafayette lived in the White House in August and early September with John Quincy Adams, who was an old friend of his as well. But Lafayette had close relationships with all the former presidents. And he engendered or started a friendship with Andrew Jackson. So in his journal, uh, Levasseur tells about Lafayette's visits to these old friends and to his new friend, Andrew Jackson. Uh, Jefferson is described as the ever gracious host. Levasseur comments on the good appearance and cheerfulness of the Negroes of Monticello as attesting to the humanity of their master, but elsewhere describes slavery as a crime against humanity and advocates for the education of blacks and gradual emancipation, echoing Lafayette's views which he had held since the 1780s. At Jackson's home in Tennessee, Lafayette is shown pistols that he had given Washington in 1778 and now belong to Jackson. They were actually a present by a Washington descendant to Jackson who was running for president in 1824. When Lafayette recognizes them and comments that he felt true satisfaction in finding them in the hands of a man so worthy of such a legacy, Jackson blushes and his eye gleams as on a day of victory. The next story is, one of, well, it's probably my favorite story in the book. So it takes place on August 6th. Lafayette is living in the White House. August 6th, 1825. He comes down to breakfast and he tells President John Quincy Adams, or he asks him if we could go visit his predecessor, James Monroe. And uh, Adams says, fine, I'll put together an expedition. Three carriages, about 12 people, including Lafayette's party, his son and his secretary, a, a couple of friends of Adams and one of his sons. They crossed the Potomac, and the Potomac is a toll bridge. And Adams pays the toll. They're continuing on. When they hear a clatter behind them, it's the toll taker. Mr. President, Mr. President, you're 11 cents short. <laughs> so this scene ensues where they're counting, the, the president gets out, they're counting how many people, how many carriages, because the price depended on those variables. And while this is going on, the toll taker recognizes Lafayette and says, oh, I'm not going to take a toll from the nation's guests. <laughs> I'll take one for you, for your, your carriage. So they keep counting. And, Adam says, I insist, this is a private visit we're making. It's not a public function. We're going to pay. They keep counting. And sure enough, he's 11 cents short. He pays it, and they continue on. And the author, Livasaur, says, it is ironic that the only time that a toll was paid for Lafayette in the entire 13-month trip was in the presence of the head of state, a circumstance which under any other uh, in any other country would surely have conferred immunity. <laughs> so Lafayette died uh, on May 20, 1834, uh, after having played an important role in still another revolution, the Revolution of 1830, which overthrew the Bourbons for the second time. President Jackson gave Lafayette the same military honors as John Adams had on Washington's death, America mourned. There were eulogies uh, all over the country. Edward Everett gave a two-hour eulogy at Fanville Hall on September 6th, uh, which was Lafayette's birthday, 1834. On December 31st, John Quincy Adams, now a congressman, gave the official eulogy in the United States. There were 50,000 copies ordered to be published for the House and another 10,000 for the senators. Um, I will end this talk with an obituary, but it will not be an obituary of Lafayette, otherwise we'd be here for another couple of hours. <laughs> so this is an obituary of a man who died in Philadelphia during the blizzard of 1888. His name was David Kramer. Not a household name, for sure. So the obituary, in all caps, he didn't die of the blizzard. He died of diseases, but he, he died during it. The, the first line of the obituary, all caps, a man who knew Lafayette dead. 
David Kramer died on Monday evening, the 12th, after several months' illness of a complication of diseases in the 73rd year of his age. So if you can still do mental math, subtract 73 from 88 to find out when he was born. He many years ago resided in Philadelphia where he was a contractor and erected many fancy dwellings for the leading men of that city. He was a member of the F and AM, the Freemasons, Carpenters Association, which was a high-end guild, and the I.O. of O.F., the Odd Fellows. And at one time was an active member of the city council. And here, here's the very lead. In his youth, he had the pleasure of seeing and conversing with General Lafayette during his last visit to America. So if you do the math, David Kramer was nine years old when he, with 5,000 other school children, the newspaper says 70 schools sent 70 students to visit Lafayette outside of Independence Hall on August 4th, 1824. So he was there on August 4th, 1824 for perhaps 30 seconds max, and that was apparently the most important event of his very useful life. Thank you. So we can, uh, I'm happy to take questions, or Peter can talk about the, uh, what's going on on September 3rd. Uh, whatever you want. Any questions? We'll do that first. Yes, sir. In uh, 1981, this town had a uh, bicentennial. And we went over to, people from this town went over to uh, France and brought someone home back here whose name was Lord Sterling. Sterling. And you talked about Lord Sterling in there. Yeah. Is it from the same town? Obviously not the same people, but do you know anything about that? I don't know anything about the person from France, but I know that Lord Sterling people came from Scotland. Okay, maybe it was Scotland. Yeah. But uh, the spelling of Sterling is S-T-E-R, and his spelling was S-T-I-R. Yeah. And someone thought, someone thought that way back when that there was a misspelling and Sterling should have been S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G. No, because I'll, of I'll give you my take on that. S-T-I-R is correct. That all the historians and biographers <clears throat> Say S P I R, and I think there's a I I'm, I don't know this, but I think there's a, uh, a town or a city in Scotland that is spelled S T I R. There's a castle yes. there, Stirling Castle. It was a S T I R. Yep. Yeah. 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 But yeah. the people they think that this town got spelled wrong <laughs> some time in the past, <laughs> and it never it never was corrected. The other question I've got is uh, the Freemasons. Yes. Are they the, the, the same group as the Freemasons right now? Oh, yes. They were very much involved with Lafayette. Every town or city uh, that they had a lodge, they would uh, meet with them, they'd give them dinners, etc. He was a, uh, even before 1824, he was a pretty important Freemason, um, certainly in France. But after 1824, um, he got admitted to several lodges here. But more importantly, uh, according to the New York Lodge, New York State Lodge, there were 75 lodges named Lafayette Lodge. And it's, they were, all of them are after 1824. We, uh, we, we did a, a trial run event in uh, 2018 in Charlton at the Rider Tavern, uh, which, was not, which, which was another stop. And the uh, Colonial Craftsmen, who are a Masonic group mm -hmm. participated in that, and the guy they they probably they, they 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 put on one of the best shows I think. And but the the, the, the guy who's in charge said they were inviting black they, they invited him back for uh, 1825, and they still have the apron <laughs> that he uh, um, that he that he, that he wore in uh, 1825. So, so the, the Bunker Hill ceremony was a Masonic ceremony. I know you are. Yeah. So he was very uh, close to the Masons. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, yes, uh, the gloves that you sent the picture around. Yes. Can you tell me who the people are that are depicted on those gloves? Uh, can you remember the people that are depicted on the gloves? I, I noticed that they were actual faces. Well, Lafayette is on both, but on one of them it's Lafayette and Washington. Lafayette and Washington? They were paired in a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, souvenirs. And, and how is that embossed on there? Uh, I guess it, they, they stamped it on, but they were professional engravers that did that. Some of them are pretty well known. Uh, well, they're beautiful. Yeah. Yes? Could you tell me um, the name of the family that he stayed with in Bolton? S.B.S. Oh. Wilder. Wow. Oh, Sam S.B.S. Wilder. As a matter of fact, Mayor Quincy, uh, Mayor Quincy was kind of staging Lafayette's trip to make sure to make sure he got back in back in time. He wrote to the towns. He wrote that we have a thing uh, that shows the letter, the note that he wrote to Newburyport that that he'd be staying there, and um, in S. B. S. Wilder's. Um, uh, memoirs. Uh, he, he, he heard from Mayor Quincy and Quincy told him, you got to get him within 10 miles of Hartford uh, on, uh, on, on, on uh, September 3rd in the, in the evening and they, they didn't quite make it. Uh, uh, the wagon broke down some, some, somewhere in Connecticut. But Sterling, uh, I don't know, Wilder went to, um, um, Wilder went to Concord to pick him up. And uh, and and brought him, uh, uh, brought him to the house. There's a Wilder descendant that was. Uh, yeah. with... Wilder was a diplomat. Yes, he was yeah, born in yeah. France. Yeah, he, he had a little uh, hut that he created because Napoleon was going to hide out of his house. Yeah, so it's had to work. Yeah, it didn't quite work out. No, but the, the foundation is supposed to still be yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Another question. Yes. Uh, his name, Lafayette's name, you're only calling him Lafayette. His name is long. It is long. Can right? you explain his name, please? No, I, I can't. I've never committed to <laughs> memory. But his first name was Gilbert. Yes. Yeah. And one of the other Saint names Marie. is Motier. Mm -hmm. That Marie. is more like a family name. And I don't know what, Eve, you it's, know. It's like multi it, it has about eight separate names. And I never was able to memorize it. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I just wonder what it was all about. One for each of the great-great grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> Very long. So, oh, fantastic. When are you speaking again and where? Oh, uh, boy. I think my next speech, you know, I have a human rights speech, which is different from this. Uh, it's about all that, that type of stuff. But, um, I think my next, I think we're going to be in Rhode Island on uh, May 10th, something like that, May 8th. All in anticipation of this great event. Yeah, well, yeah. but I've been doing the speak, speaking for, since 2007. Mm -hmm. So I have a website, it's a website of the book and... Uh, That's your book? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a website of the book and I list all the events and there's current events, you know, pending, and then past. And I meant to count the past ones just to know how many. How did you get started on Lafayette? Since you were a little? No, no, 2002. What happened that made you so? I read a book uh, called uh, America's Jubilee about the 50th anniversary of social history. The whole first chapter was about the farewell tour. I had never heard of the farewell tour. I mean, it was a, history major, early American history I concentrated in. So I was kind of curious and I was in New York and I came down, I, I came down. I stayed at my brother-in-law's. I had depositions. I was a lawyer in New York. And he says to me, uh, by the way, the reason, I, I know the exact date. It was September 17th, 2002 because I had billing records, I actually checked this. But he says to me, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, 
Yale was yesterday, you know, late. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, no, I'll get you a book. He, he's very intellectual, so he, he loves to go to the uh, Strand Bookstore in New York, if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. Antiquarian plus current books. So I said, okay, get me a book on Lafayette. So he got me two, and that's when I got hooked. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very, very much. much. Oh, oh, I'll ask you more.